power that we gain from one another as women. Talking about some of the issues and the challenges that face us, whether it is the barriers that may come with some level of discrimination or pay inequity or just the gender stereotypes that, that continue to exist, that we, as we talk about the challenges, we not, we not forget to focus on the extraordinarily positive attributes, the resilience, the tenacity, the adaptability. This, this is what you see manifested here in this room. We have extraordinary entrepreneurs. I, I, I saw Zoe here just a moment ago. We've uh, visited throughout the summer at the farmer's market. And you think about young entrepreneurs like her, uh, the Salmon Sisters that uh, are also here somewhere. I can't see everybody out there recognizing the contributions of so many, those who have served us as our veterans, those who are our industry leaders, business leaders, those that are leaders in education, those that are advocates, whether it be for, for women and domestic violence, advocates for children, advocates for seniors. Again, you think about a powerful group of people, and that's what, that's what this room brings together. Now, I've been asked to speak this morning about barriers that I have encountered along the way. And I spent a lot of time thinking about this because I put myself to bed really early last night with Vix. And Vix, I don't know about you, but it brings about childhood memories for me. <laughs> because there wasn't a single cold that I ever had that my mom didn't smother my chest with Vix. And I would squirm and say I hated it. And she said, putting Vix on your chest is all about love. Now just relax, it's okay. <laughs> and I do that to my boys who would squirm and squiggle and I'd say it's all about love. And they'd relax. And to this day, I think that they still associate Vix with their mom. <laughs> but I, I don't want to go on about that, but I do want to tell you that it did cause me to reflect about my upbringings and the barriers that I encountered and, and, and then how, how you really move beyond those. And when you think about the barriers, you had a lot of good discussion this morning about, about the, the barriers that, that, that really can be extraordinary obstacles. If you don't, a girl doesn't have an opportunity for an education, we see what that leads to. Uh, internationally, and you, you think about the suppression of, of women, and so much of it begins with, with a failure or an inability to gain that education. Fortunately, I was not from a family where education was not valued. But I was from a family that spent, I spent my growing up years in small islanded communities in Southeast. I was born down in Ketchikan and spent my early growing up years in, in Wrangell, and then we moved to the big city, we moved to Juneau. But again, you're, you're an islanded community. We always lived out the road, so we didn't have a lot of neighbors. We had one another as, uh, as best friends. It helped to, to come from a larger family. But it was interesting because the expectations in, in a family where you had four girls was that, well, one of you is going to be a nurse, and one of you is going to be a teacher. Well, I decided, OK, my grandma's a teacher. I'll be a teacher. And from the time I was a little bit of a girl, that was, that was where I was going to go. And my sister, my younger sister, decided, OK, well, I'll be the nurse, because I'm the only one that can stand the side of blood. <laughs> and we kind of divided it up that way. Fortunately, there wasn't a lot of pressure for the boys to become priests because they would have failed miserably. <laughs> but it was, as I think back on it, there were some pretty stere gender stereotypical norms in my family. And uh, I was okay with that, I guess, because I didn't, 
no much different, no much better. But as I reflect back on it, and I think, well, okay, I didn't end up being a teacher. But when I think about the expectation, the subtle expectation from my parents was that you can be a nurse, you can be a, 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 a teacher, but the expectation is that you go to school, you go to college for it. So even from the very, very beginning, the expectation was education had to be a priority. And that was through all six of us. There was ne never any discussion that you would not go. The real question was where you would go. So making sure that when we, when we think about those barriers, the education piece is, is so critical. But again, when you think about the barriers that are out there, the gender stereotype that may be in place, low expectations, just an expectation that, well, you're a girl, you don't have to throw as well. I still hold that against my dad. I throw like a girl and that really bothers me. <laughs> I'm sure I could have been a much better baseball player. But in my family, it was, it was okay to not do as well in math and science as English, as history. It was just okay, all right. I was pushed to do well in school, but I kind of got a pass. Where was STEM when I was growing up? You know, I, I look at, at the STEM opportunities that we're putting in front of our young, young women today, and it's like, yes, let's knock down those expectations that Girls can do this and boys can do that. There's, there's no reason for, for any of that. But then you also have just your own doubt of self, of what you can contribute. And I mentioned to you, I, I wanted to be or believe that I was going to be a teacher. And I was in my sophomore year of college focusing on an education degree, and I had to take an economics course. It was a requirement, and I wasn't doing well because I didn't care. I had a very lackadaisical attitude about it. I knew I could do better, but I didn't care. And the professor called me in halfway, right before midterms. His name was Russ Beaton, and Russ Beaton said to me, you better drop my class because I'm gonna fail you. I said, why are you gonna fail me? He says, because you clearly don't get it, and you can't get it. Well, <laughs> I kicked my lackadaisical self in the rear end. I don't recall what I ended up getting in his course, but I stayed in his course. And then just to spite him, I changed my major from education <laughs> to economics. <laughs> this is a true story. When Lisa introduced me, she said I got my, my BA in economics. And it wasn't because I had this driving desire. It was because somebody said, I don't think you can do this. I guess it says something about my personality. <laughs> but it was, it was a reminder to me that I, I, just, I didn't have my own self-confidence to, to really push myself until somebody else said, maybe you can't do this. When you think about women going into political office, this is where you see a lot of the self-doubt. This is where you have women coming forward and they're saying, I don't have the experience. I may be too young. I, I, I need to figure out the balance with my family and so I can't do that. It's too difficult for women to raise the kind of money that they need to raise to mount a campaign. And this is where, this is where we all need to be there for other women, to help erase that doubt, to, to push aside the notion that women cannot be as strong of fundraisers, to dispel the myth that you cannot have a strong career in public service while at the same time raising a family. Letting people know that the experience on that resume has to start somewhere and is never, ever going to be convenient in your life to run for 
for public office. There will always be something else. It will be your family, it will be your career track, it will be retirement, there will always be something else that interferes. So if you're waiting for the perfect time, you're never, you're never gonna jump into it. But making sure that women are supporting women when it comes to that, that assurance that you've got this, because we got your back here. There was a young woman that was considering running for the, for the legislature. She was young, she was just out of law school. She was working as an, as an aide in the legislature, but with pretty limited experience. And there were a few people who saw a great potential in this young woman and said, we gotta push her to do it. And I can remember the dinner that Liesl McGuire and I had in Juneau. We sat in a small table for two, uh, looking out the window there, and I convinced Liesl that she didn't need to wait until she had a resume that was two pages long that she had the passion, she had the conviction, she had the purpose to serve, and what she needed was some encouragement. And that encouragement from myself and from others allowed her to be a leader in our state, in our legislature, for a decade plus. And I'm just so pleased to be Lisa took that leap. She had those doubts, let me tell you. But she took that leap when others came around and gave her that support. Balance of family is one that, when I think about barriers, barriers to women, this is one that so many have struggled with. And it's not just in the policy making realm, it's in whatever professional career you have. I, I have served in that role of being the, the senator that raised a couple kids and living to tell the story. And I can't tell you the number of calls that I get from women who are seeking office who say, I'm thinking about running, but I've got young kids. I just don't know if this is the right time, if this is right for me. And so to have the, the sit down with Kelly Ayotte when her kids were about five and seven, I think, is what, where, where they were when she was considering running for the United States Senate. And to this day, we talk mom to mom, kind of bucking one another up when she says, you know, I wasn't able to be there for my daughter's ballet rehearsal and it's just ripping me up. And this comes to you after a casual, hey, how you doing, Kelly? Well, this is where, again, we need to be there to remind one another that, that we can be there for our kids, while at the same time, we are there for our country, we are there for our state, but it's hard. And this is not a partisan thing. Kirsten Gillibrand, a good friend of mine representing the state of, of New York, also raising two young boys. So she looks to me as the mom with the older boys that did it. Okay, you got your kids not only through middle school, but you got them through high school. Tell me how you did it. You know what's interesting though, is I never, I never hear other colleagues asking Pat Toomey, who has a bunch of young kids, or Chris Murphy from Connecticut, who has several young kids. How are you doing? How are you balancing the family life? Because it's just assumed that you got it. Your wife has, has everything controlled at home. They didn't give Vern the benefit of the doubt there. They didn't give Kelly Ayotte's husband or Kirsten Gillibrand's husband the benefit of the doubt that they're there making sure that the lunches are good and the kids are off to school. So it's, it's kind of a double standard there, and I think we know that. And rather than getting held back with the fact that it's a double standard, I think the message is to do the best job that you can do every day as the best mom that you can be, 
the best senator you can be, the best legislator that you can be. And that's what our kids expect. They want us to be there as that good role model. But I will tell you, sometimes the toughest critics are not my male colleagues. It's, it's other women that I encounter who say, hmm, how are those kids of yours doing? <laughs> and, and you feel that. You feel that. And you know what? I understand why they say that. Because think about it. It's like, my day's so crazy busy. I've got to I gotta pick them up. I gotta go over here. We got, we've got uh, <coughs> soccer with one kid. We've got hockey with the other kid. I've got homework. I've got a full-time job. My mom is sick. You know, everything is going on. How how can she, who has this big job back in Washington D.C. or this big job in Juneau, how can she do that? So this is where again, woman to woman, it it, it helps to say. I don't know how you're doing it, but God bless you for doing it. Because that's the encouragement that we need. I, I, uh, I recognize that we're at an all-time high in the United States Senate with 20% of the Senate female. To me, that's uh, still way too low for an all-time high. So we got a lot more work to do to make sure that when it comes to, to legislating, whether it's in Washington, D.C., or whether it's Juneau, that we have more women that are our lawmakers, that are our policymakers. And in order for them to get there, they need this kind of support. They need this, this empowerment. <clears throat> People have asked if I have experienced any level of, of discrimination or pushback in the United States Senate. And to be honest with you, by the time you're, you're at that level, everybody has worked pretty darn hard to get there. And so I really do feel that I, I am treated as, as an equal. And that's important, because otherwise it's pretty tough to do your job. But there's still little things that you notice. Whenever there's a you know a huddle of, of women on the Senate floor, you know, four or five of us, and we're talking about, I mean, we could be talking about the weather. And every now and again, you'll have one of our male colleagues walk by saying, whoa, break it up here. What's going on here? What's going on here? It's like, well, they're just talking. When you guys get together in the huddle, you don't have the women say, oh my gosh, what's going on? What's going on? I mean, I'm, it's, it's somewhat joking, but, but it, it, it is just kind of a reminder that for many, it's still a new phenomenon, the presence of, of women on, on the Senate floor. It wasn't too many years ago, and I think I shared this at, at prior Women's Summit, it wasn't too many years ago that the women of the Senate achieved potty parity. We didn't have, we laugh, but we didn't have a real women's restroom on the floor of the well, on the same level as the as the Senate chambers. The men have had their men's room and the women had a converted room closet just off of the men's room. And so it was a big deal. It was a big deal when just a couple years ago the women of the Senate celebrated our new bathroom because now we had more than two stalls. It was a big deal. Um, it's kind of funny to think about it, but it is just a reminder that in many ways, women in the Senate were, were not even considered. They weren't an afterthought. They didn't become an afterthought until we got the broom closet. So we're making, we're making headway there. And I think in many ways, the way that we do it is the relationship building that we engage in. The women of the Senate, Republicans and Democrats, get together for, for our women's dinners about every six weeks or so. And it, sometimes we talk issues, but more often than not, it's just conversation. It's women getting together over food, a glass of wine, just kind of kicking your shoes off, 
and just being with one another. And sometimes it helps to commiserate about what's going on or what's not happening or what is happening. And it's that relationship that I think lends to success. Liesl mentioned the energy bill, and I have to correct you. You said that we haven't seen energy reform in six years. It's nine years. It's been nine years. And so when I became chairman of the Energy Committee, I said, it's time. We need to do a major energy reform bill. My ranking member is Senator Maria Campbell from the state of Washington. We were looked at initially, and this was kind of going around in the, in the energy uh, publications. Whoa, look at the team on energy. Murkowski and Cantwell, nothing's gonna happen. They said, well, Lisa is, she's looking to develop Anwar yesterday. Cantwell wants to turn it into wilderness tomorrow. Don't expect anything out of the Energy Committee. Well, it's kind of like the same challenge that I got from Russ Beaton when he told me I couldn't, couldn't uh, pass his economics class or that a write-in campaign for the United States Senate might be impossible. It was like, wait a minute. This is a challenge to us. Why can't we? Let's prove them wrong. And so Maria and I sat down with our, with our staff directors and said, let's do this. Let's commit right now to not just a message. Let's commit to changing policy in the energy space. And so we set out to do it a year and a half ago. And I'm proud to say that we have defied all of the skeptics. It has been, this, this bill was dead three or four or five or six times already. They said it would never get to conference. Never, never, never. It's in conference. And my, my guess is that we will either be the first or the second legislative matter before the House and the Senate when we return in a lame duck. We're gonna get an energy reform bill because two women said, let's not focus on what we can't do. Let's focus on what we can do. And that's what we're working to do. That's what we're working to build. And that's, that's how you move forward. You know, I, I still believe that women <coughs> particularly in, in so many of the sectors that I see represented here today, that women just work harder and more times than not, it's to be proven a point because we are operating in a male-dominated world. And so I will work just a little bit harder. I will push myself just a little bit more. Sometimes it's to prove a point to me, sometimes it's to prove a point to others, but I think what, what we all have done is we have raised the bar. We have raised that expectation for, for young women, these, these young women that are here from West, the young women that I've invited to be my guests here today. I think we just set the bar up there that anything you want to do, anything you want to do is possible. So don't let there be barriers that either you impose on yourself or that you allow others to perhaps impose upon you. And I think, I think that's where we can really be making a difference individually and collectively. I'm gonna leave you with one last story. Uh, and this is one that has been shared by, uh, uh, through the internet, through the TV, and this goes back to a couple years ago where DC just got totally slammed by snow. And of course, when, when weather happens in Washington, everything stops, but when snow comes, it really stops. Well, the session had been canceled, but we needed to go into a pro forma session to, to just do some, some cleanup business. And the word went out that uh, they, needed, they needed some help on the Senate floor. Well, I am within walking distance of the Capitol, so I put on my boots and my hat. It was actually lovely. 
was gorgeous. There was nobody else out there. You're slogging and singing Christmas carols. It was wonderful. And I get to the floor, and uh, I am reading the script in place of the majority leader, uh, opening the floor, closing it. And the presiding officer is Senator Collins from Maine. Well, go figure, Alaska and Maine. <laughs> There's nothing about weather that's going to discourage the two of us. But what was equally interesting and worthy of observation was that every other person on the floor was female. The parliamentarian was female. Her clerk's staff were all females. But then we also have the pages. We got a lot of, you know, and it's 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 equally divided, boys and girls. But it was the it was the female pages that had come in that were that were on the floor. I think that there was one one guy that was affiliated with the, the sergeant at arms, but but beyond that, it was all women. And so you're kind of looking around the floor and thinking, well, this is interesting. I kind of like it. <laughs> and, and I made that observation on the floor, and of course that went viral. That you know, basically, it's snow. Snow comes, and only the women show up to work. <laughs> and we thought it was a lot of fun. We got a little bit of heat from some of our male colleagues who said, "Well, wait a minute. I was there. I was in town. Why didn't they ask me? I would have showed up." And you know what the difference was. The ask was not, Lisa, will you come in and preside or, or take the place of the majority leader? It was a call for volunteers. So those pages that came in, it was the girls that volunteered. On the, on the parliamentarian and the clerk staff, it was the women that volunteered. And to me, that's pretty telling. We come not when we are told, I need you and you and you, but when a call for help goes out, okay, I can do it. I got a lot of other things on my plate, and this is really inconvenient, but I'm going to do it. And I think that should be a message to all of us that we stand and go to work, we juggle multiple balls in the air all the time. We don't necessarily get the credit for it, but that's okay, because we're going to sleep better at night, knowing, just maybe, that we made a little bit of difference for a few people. Thank you for making a big difference for us.